So I'm your stand-in for the evening, I'm sorry to say. That's fine, Steve. Um, lucky for you, Nick is not with us this evening. So we have um, Nick James this evening going to talk to us about a fine eclipse, I'm, I'm hoping, uh, amongst other things. Um, in the future, next month, on the 12th of April, we have Melissa Gallone talking to us about the evolution of galaxies, um, amongst other things. And following that, we're going to be into May. Um, and uh, I think we have Nick Hewitt giving a talk to us in May. And Jens in June giving us a talk on infinity, which I'm really looking forward to. Um, so we've had Nick talk to us, talk to the society before. He's long been associated with in the Northamptonshire Natural History Society, and long may that continue. Fully appreciate that he's he's giving up his time to talk to us this evening. And so without further ado, I hand over to Nick James. Thank you, Steve. Um, everyone hear me okay? Yep. Grant, and I shall share my screen. <clears throat> and start the presentation going. Okay, um, hopefully you can see that full screen now. Um, so, yes, so this evening I'm gonna to talk to you about two of my great interests in astronomy. So I'm director of the BAA Comet section. So those little fuzzy things that come and go in the night sky that, that often disappoint us, but sometimes give us really spectacular views. Um, I find comets really fascinating things. And also um, in my life so far, I think I've seen 15 total eclipses. So I, I find total eclipses absolutely fascinating as well and wherever possible travel to, uh, to see them. So uh, to combine the two, that is to see a comet at a total eclipse is um, something I've been wanting to do for a long time. And uh, I was lucky enough, very lucky indeed, to get to the uh, last total eclipse on December the 14th last year, which was in Argentina. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that eclipse and, uh, and what we saw in terms of comets at that eclipse. But I thought it would be a good idea just to run through um, comets that have previously been seen at total eclipses. And there are not many of them, so don't worry, it's not going to be too long a talk. Um, so the idea is that I'll talk a little bit about what comets are for those of you who maybe don't know, um, and then talk about a particular kind of comet, which are comets which are, are very bright when they're close to the sun. Um, so these are comets that can be seen in the daytime, um, and they generally tend to belong to a family of comets called Kreutz sun grazers, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Then I'll talk about comets that have been seen at historical eclipses, and there are not very many of them, uh, verified ones. So there are three listed there. There are a couple of other possibilities, but they are considered to be not very likely. Uh, and then some more recent examples, as our technologies improved, uh, the ability to see faint comets during a total eclipse has, has improved as well. So you'd expect the, the rate at which people see comets at total eclipses to be going up. Uh, it is a bit, but from a very, very low base. Um, and then I'll conclude uh, talking about the eclipse last year and the comets that we saw there. So all in all, talk should last probably about an hour or so. Hopefully that's going to be OK. Um, so what we'll do is we'll just start with a brief introduction to what comets are. So comets in, in the kind of public uh, mind are something that looks a little bit like this. So a comet has uh, a bright head, uh, we call it the coma technically, and it has one or more different tails. Uh, now this comet is a comet that was around in 1996. Uh, it was a comet discovered by a Japanese observer called Hayakitaki, so it's called Comet Hayakitaki. Um, but there are several comets that were discovered by that observer, so to distinguish between them, it also has a designation, and we actually call this comet 1996 B2, Hayakitaki. So 1996 is the year it was discovered in. 
B means it was discovered in the second two week period of 1996 and two means it was the second comet discovered in that two week period. So from the comet designation, you can tell which two week period the comet was discovered in and, and which comet in that two week period it was. So this one, 1996 B2, uh, was a, a rather small comet, but it came very close to the Earth and it demonstrated very clearly one of the kinds of tails that a comet has. Um, this is the ion or gas tail. So within the head or the coma of the comet here is a very small thing called the nucleus, which you can imagine is something like a, a deep frozen snowball um, consisting of water and uh, carbon dioxide ices mainly and lots of, of dirty material, so silicate type material, all bound together, all kept in deep freeze in the far distant solar system. Every now and again, for various reasons, a comet nucleus might fall in from the deep solar system towards the sun. As it gets heated by the sun, um, the icy material in the nucleus turns into a gas. It turns actually directly into a, a gas. It doesn't go through a liquid phase. It doesn't melt. It goes through a process called sublimation. So it, it turns directly from, from ice into a gas. That gas expands rushes away from the nucleus and as it rushes away from the nucleus it also takes a lot of the dirty dusty material with it as well. So around the nucleus forms the coma which you can think of as the comet's atmosphere, very very thin coma, and the sunlight falling on the gases in that coma ionizes the uh, various species and makes them susceptible to electric and magnetic fields and the sun's solar wind, which is flowing out from the sun almost directly, pushes that ionized gas back into a tail. And you can see here very clearly a nice tail behind this comet. So this, this comet was a very gassy comet, not very much dust. And so you can see this straight tail which points away from the sun. And it's blown away from the sun by the solar wind, which is moving at something like 400 kilometers a second, that kind of speed. And that's what's blowing this gas away. A different kind of comet is this one. Uh, this is a, a beautiful comet that was seen in 2007 from the Southern Hemisphere. This is Comet 2006-P1 uh, McNaught. It was discovered by uh, Robert McNaught. And uh, this comet was a very dusty comet. And what you can see here is the dust tail. And the dust tail is different from the gas tail in that the gas tail would go pretty much straight away from the sun. The dust tail curves away from the sun. And the reason for that is that the forces that are pushing the dust particles away are different to the forces that are pushing the gas particles, the gas species away. The dust is being pushed away by what's called solar radiation pressure. So the dust particles are very small, they're like talcum powder, and that means that they can be affected by the very small forces that are exerted upon them by just the sun's light shining on those dust particles. But because they're still fairly massive, they don't move directly away from the sun, they just get pushed along behind the comet's orbit. And so they tend to form this, this arc behind the comet. And we had something similar, although nowhere near as spectacular, with the comet that we saw last summer, Comet Nearwise, uh, 2020 F3 last year. That had quite strong dust tail, and it also had these striation features in it, which are a result of, of dust being ejected from the nucleus in a, in a periodic manner as the nucleus rotates. So pulses of dust are coming out and they follow particular trajectories behind the comet to form this lovely tail. But this is a massive thing that we see on the sky, but what's actually causing it is a tiny, tiny nucleus, probably only a kilometer or two in diameter, right at the very center of that coma down here. And the nucleus is so small that we could never ever see it with an earthbound telescope. And the only reason we know what cometary nuclei look like is because we've sent spacecraft there to have a look at them. And this is an example of a typical cometary nucleus, quite a big one, actually. This is Comet 67P, Schwashman Vakman. Um, and this is uh, imagery turned into a digital model and then animated. Um, by Matthias Malmer, uh, taken by the Rosetta spacecraft, which the European Space Agency sent to this comet, and which orbited around the comet, watching it as it came in from the outer solar system, becoming more and more and more active 
uh, and showing material coming off the surface. So most cometary nuclei, we expect to be irregular like this. They're small, they're so small that their gravity uh, can't, can't pull the structure into a spherical form that we would expect of a, a planet, for instance. And the other thing is, is that we think that these things are not very strong. We think that they um, are only really a loose aggregation of material. Um, so they are held together by their own gravity, but if, if they span too fast, um, they, could, they could fly apart. So that's what limits the spin rate of these, these objects. Um, as they spin up, eventually they'll, they'll pull themselves to pieces. And we'll see that in a minute with some other comets that go close to the sun. Another thing that can cause a comet to fragment is the tidal forces that result from going close to the sun. And that's generally what happens to small comets that go very close to the sun. They, they tend to be pulled apart by the sun's gravity. So the very bright comets that can be seen in the daylight sky um, are generally comets that go very, very close to the sun. So the reason that the comet is bright is that it's being very strongly heated by the sun, it becomes very active. And because it's very close to the sun, the solar radiation falling on it is very high. So it reflects a lot of that back to us. And what I've done on this plot here is plot for every comet that's known, and there are 3,000, just over 3,500 of them, I've plotted a graph, um, and each of these crosses is a comet. I plotted a graph which shows along the x-axis the distance that that comet is when it's at the closest from the sun. We call that the perihelion distance. And on the y-axis, I've plotted the inclination of the orbit. So that's how, uh, how tilted the orbit is with respect to the Earth's orbit. So that can go up to 90 degrees, which is the maximum tilt it can have. And then beyond that, it comes back down the other side. And, and comets with inclinations greater than 90 degrees, we call retrograde, because they're going around the sun in the opposite direction to um, comets, uh, to, the, to the Earth and all the planets. Um, now this distance scale is logarithmic. So one astronomical unit is the distance that the Earth has from the sun. So that's about 150 million kilometers. 10 astronomical units is well out beyond the orbit of Saturn. Um, 0.1 astronomical units is then 15 million kilometers. 0.01 is one and a half million. 0.001 is only 150,000 kilometers. And the sun's radius is about 0.004 AU, so, so down here somewhere. Um, now you can see that there's a lot of random crosses on this diagram, but in fact there are a number of groups as well. This big group here um, are what are called the Jupiter family comets, so they're comets that orbit around the sun almost in the plane of the solar system. Um, in orbits between about two and five astronomical units. So they're comets that have been uh, affected by the planet Jupiter. So they're called Jupiter family comets. But we can also see there are a few clumps uh, closer in. And if we actually have a look at where these are in relation to some particular parts of uh, things in the solar system, we can see that these things are actually really close in towards the sun. So the two vertical lines here show distances which correspond to two things. This one is the average, uh, is the perihelion distance of Mercury from the Sun. So this is the closest point that the innermost planet Mercury gets to the Sun. You can see here it's about point, uh, point 0.3 astronomical units, something like that. This line is what's called the fluid Roche limit, and that's the point at which if the comet had no, if the comet nucleus had no internal strength, so if it was simply, let's say, a globule of of fluid that was being held together by its own gravity. Uh, this is the point at which the sun's tidal forces would rip that comet nucleus apart. So any comet that stays in one piece uh, further in than this fluid Roche limit must have some internal strength, must have some, uh, some rigidity. Um, now in terms of the groups that we see in here, there are, there are groups in outside the fluid Roche limit, and there's this one big group here which is inside. So those groups have actually got names, and they're postulated to be groups of comets which all originated from a, the same parent body at some point in the past for each group, um, which then broke up 
at a perihelion, perihelion return. And then you have multiple comets spread around the orbit, all of which have very similar orbital parameters uh, because they're all related to the original object, but which have for various perturbations have been pushed around the orbit. So they, they're at different points along the same orbit. And you can see there's, there's this group, which is called the 96P group, which is actually uh, named for its progenitor comet, which is 96P Machholz. And there are two subgroups of that called the Marsden and Cracked subgroups. There's this subgroup, which is quite obvious, which is the Mayer subgroup. But then the one that we're most interested in is this subgroup. It's called the Kreutz subgroup. And it is the group of pretty much all the very bright sun grazers that have been seen in history. So comets which have um, been the brightest comets that we've seen in the whole of human recorded history, all of them relate to this Kreutz sun grazer group. And the reason they're bright is because they get very, very close to the sun and both the extreme heating makes them very active and being close to the sun means that they, they're reflecting a lot of light and scattering a lot of light as well. And it's thought that these Kreutz objects all came from a, a single progenitor which broke up at a perihelion thousands of years ago. And then each individual um, fragment of that broke up at subsequent perihelions. So you've had a, a kind of fragmenting history of comets, which now means that there's a whole chain of comets around this orbit. And we, we regularly see small Kreutz sun grazers going very close to the sun in data from spacecraft that can actually see close to the surface of the sun. So every, every, every week or two, there'll be a Kreutz sun grazer passing the sun, but generally they're not very big, not very impressive. But the big ones can be extremely impressive. And here's an example of one of them. This is, in fact, notable also for being the first comet in history that was discovered by a telescope. This is 1680v1. So it was discovered in 1680 by uh, Godfried Kirsch using a telescope. And this is a view of it over Amsterdam um, in the twilight with its head very close to the sun, big long tail streaming up behind. Very, very bright comet. A couple of other examples of what Kreutz group sun grazers can be like. These are two of the potentially brightest comets that we've ever seen. 1843 D1, um, which is this one here, shown in a painting by Smythe uh, from the Cape of Good Hope, uh, showing the comet in the daylight sky, not far from the sun. But the brightest of all of the Kreutz comets that we know is this one, 1882 R1. Um, it was seen actually telescopically, and I'm not sure how people made this observation. Uh, it was followed up to the sun's limb. It was probably magnitude minus 15, minus 16, or possibly even brighter. It was visible in telescopes up to the sun's limb, where it then transited in front of the sun, but it wasn't seen in transit. And then very shortly afterwards, it was eclipsed by the sun. So it's the only object that we know that's transited and been eclipsed by the sun in less than a day. Uh, because another thing about these Kreutz comets is that when they're at their close to the, closest to the sun, they're moving extremely rapidly because they're at their lowest point in their orbit. So they're moving probably with a speed of five or 600 kilometers a second at the point that they're whizzing around the sun. So these are really bright comets um, that were seen in daylight, but they were so bright that they didn't need to be seen during an eclipse because they were actually visible in broad daylight, even with the bright sun. There are other comets that are sun grazers but are not that bright, but which have been seen again close to the sun, but not during eclipses. And this is an example of one of those. This is a, a famous comet from the mid 60s called Comet Ikea Seki. It was a very bright sun grazer comet. And this is a picture taken using a thing called a coronagraph. So a coronagraph is an astronomical um, piece of equipment which effectively simulates a total eclipse. It's a telescope that has very clean and simple optics and has an occulting disc that blocks out the bright uh, photosphere of the sun. And that allows you, if you've got a very, very clear atmosphere, to see the sun's corona or atmosphere. And it also allows you to see a uh, comet. Now these coronagraphs really only work at high altitude observatories where the atmosphere is extremely clear. 
because you're you still have problems with scattering of light in the atmosphere and potentially scattering of light in the optics of the coronagraph. So they're very difficult things to make um, when certainly uh, Earth based ones also operate uh, only when the atmosphere is at its absolute clearest. We are lucky now, though, that with spacecraft, we can actually put coronagraphs in space. And so we can actually see uh, comets uh, close to the sun uh, whenever they occur. And this is a lovely example of um, another Kreutz comet called 2011 W3 Lovejoy, um, passing close to the sun, very close to the sun, and imaged by NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory. You can see here's some of the outer uh, magnetic field loops of the corona. And this is the comet scurrying through the corona at very, very high speed. And you can see how its tail is being just warped and disrupt, disrupted by, by the solar wind. Now, this comet survived and actually came out the other side to give a really good display um, to southern observers in the morning sky. But many comets of its size don't. They, they essentially get ripped apart by the sun when they're at its, clo when they're at its closest. So those are comets that are either seen in the broad daylight, they're bright enough to be seen in broad daylight, or they've been seen by spacecraft close to the sun. Comets which are fainter uh, won't be bright enough to be seen in broad daylight, but would, would be visible uh, in the case of a total eclipse. So when the sun is completely blocked out by the moon during a total eclipse, it gets dark enough to see uh, comets close to the sun, even if they're not that bright, you know, they, they might be second or third magnitude and they might be visual, uh, visible visually. And the first example we have of a comet seen at an eclipse, which looks to be lightly rather than just kind of possible, is this one. It's a comet seen in 418 called C418M1. And there was definitely a comet in 418 that was seen in the night sky. It was seen uh, first in June 4, 418 and last uh, sometime in November, and it moved from Ursa Major to Virgo in that time and was reported in a number of different sources. And um, there was a report, there was an eclipse that occurred in 418 on July the 19th. And we now know from using modern software that the comet was close to the sun um, in the sky at the time. And there is a report about a meteor being seen during the eclipse. Well, a meteor is not a comet, but people in these old references, and this was actually written something like seven years after the event, um, are not, not that precise in their language. And so people think that probably um, that wasn't a meteor, it was actually a comet. And we know that the comet would have been visible during the eclipse. And so it's kind of convenient that it fits in that this was a total eclipse where a comet was seen during the eclipse. It's not certain, uh, but it's probably the best that we have um, up until more modern times when photography came along. So that's the comet of 418 July 19th, uh, of the eclipse of 418 July 19th. The next one where we've got absolute definite evidence is this one. It's um, the total eclipse of 1882, May the 17th. And this time the comet uh, X 1882 K1 was only seen at the eclipse and was not seen in the night sky at all. Uh, so this eclipse took place in Egypt. And um, as has been the way a lot through history, there was a, a kind of big competition between British and French groups to go and observe this. And the, the British group um, wanted to take uh, a number of pictures of the solar corona um, in order to, to look at some aspects of the structure of the corona and how it worked around the sun. And these days we, we think of kind of solar eclipse photography as being relatively straightforward. In 1882, um, emulsions were very um, insensitive. So the kind of emulsions they had, the gelatin plates probably had um, ISO ratings of about one ISO, something like that. So very, very insensitive. 
Um, and they, they needed large telescopes, long focal lengths to get good resolution because the plates were not very high resolution either. And so it ended up that to go and take a photograph of, a, of an eclipse, you had to take a, a big telescope and lots of servants and uh, whole marquees and things to the eclipse site in order to be able to do this. And you also had to practice really hard because they wanted to take uh, several pictures of the corona to see if they could see motion in the corona. They only had 70 seconds of totality to do that. And the exposures they needed to record the corona were somewhere between 10 and 20 seconds. And it took something like seven seconds to take the plate out and put a new plate in. And all of that in this kind of highly charged period when you've only got 70 seconds of totality. Um, Amazingly, they did manage to, to get some images of the eclipse. I think they managed to get four plates of the eclipse. And when they developed them and looked at them, they realized that there was a, a comet that was on their photographs that they could see actually moving from one photograph to the next, because as I mentioned, these Kreutz comets move very rapidly at totality. And so they were able to actually measure positions for it off the plates and they could calculate a very rough orbit of this comet. Um, the comet was called Tufik comet because Tufek was the, the Khedive of Egypt at the time. So he was the guy in charge, or at least notionally in charge. I suppose the British were in charge really, but he was the guy who the British allowed to, uh, to run Egypt at the time. And um, so he had the, the honor applied of, of him, the comet being named after him. Um, so, this was a comet that was seen at totality, but it wasn't seen at any other time. So we, this, these photographs are, are pretty unique of this comet. Uh, there are four of them. This is one example. They're a bit strange, the photographs. They've uh, I've taken these out of a, an RAS publication, which was written shortly after the event, which has got copies of the, the plates. I'm not sure really what, what's going on here. They look a bit enhanced and they look like they've been touched up and I, I can't imagine the comet was really this prominent and I don't know what's going on around the edge of the sun here and nobody seems to know really but this is the best example we've got. We know that the comet was really there um, and we know that several people saw it uh, but these images are the first that we've got um, that we know of of a comet actually during totality. So this is um, our first example of a comet photographed during totality. One of the reasons why this comet was not seen either before or after totality is that it was only very bright uh, when it was very close to the sun. So on this plot here, we have the blue line shows the magnitude of the comet, probably reaching something like minus three at totality. Um, but the, the purple line shows its elongation, that is how far away from the sun in the sky it appears. And you can see from this that the comet's really only bright, it's only above sixth magnitude for probably something like uh, two weeks uh, around totality, and during that time it's at a very, very low elongation. So it's it's too close to the sun in the sky to be seen, except during the eclipse when the sun is conveniently blocked out by the moon. By the time it's actually a reasonable distance away from the sun beforehand, it's fallen to sort of magnitude ten or, or even fainter, and so it wouldn't have been wouldn't have been seen. Um, so that that comet is interesting in that it was photographed at an eclipse, but was never seen was not seen before and was never seen afterwards. But the orbit certainly implies that it was a Kreutz comet. Um, there's another possibility for a comet seen during an eclipse, and that's uh, the one seen at the eclipse of 1893, April 16th. Uh, but it looks like this one actually isn't really a comet. Um, the photographs of, of the supposed comet uh, are here, so showing a kind of blob on the outside of the corona. But it's now thought that this isn't a comet, that it's actually what's called a coronal mass ejection. So something that we're quite familiar with now, where the corona um, shows rapid outflowing features associated with um, explosive acti activity low in the, the sun's atmosphere above the uh, photosphere. So we think that the 1893 K 
case is, is not really an eclipse comet, although if you actually look in a lot of references online for eclipse comets, you'll find the 1893 one listed. So the next comet where we absolutely definitely have evidence that um, it was seen during eclipse is this one, which is the eclipse of uh, 1948, November the 1st. And this comet is probably the, the best eclipse comet of all. Uh, it was seen during totality. This is a, again a photograph of it, not, not the best, but unfortunately in the case of all of these old photographs, the original negatives seem to have been lost. And so we're only left with reproductions um, in, in books and journals, which is a real shame. Uh, but this was an eclipse that was seen over East Africa. Um, and during totality, many, many people saw this very bright comet with a nice tail uh, above the eclipse sun in the sky. So here's the corona, here's the comet. Uh, it was very obvious. It was photographed by um, an RAF aircraft that was flying over Kenya. And uh, this is one of the photographs they took showing that comet. So a very definite bright comet seen during totality. Now this comet was actually seen then rediscovered after totality once it had moved far enough away from the sun to be visible in a, a darkish sky. So it was rediscovered in um, uh, South Africa um, on November the 8th. Um, so a few days after the eclipse. And here you've got the BAA circular from 1948, November the 10th, where it says there can be little doubt that the bright comet now reported as seen in the southern morning sky is identical with the one seen during the eclipse of November the 1st. So this comet was different to the 1882 comet. It was seen during eclipse, but then it became a really nice comet in the evening sky. Um, one of the nice things about being a director of a BAA section is that I have all of the archives um, of our section going back in the case of the comet section to the early 1930s. So um, I've dug out lots of stuff on this comet. There's a nice newspaper report here from the star in South Africa uh, talking about how the comet was seen. This is from the BAA journal and we've got letters and notes from people who actually observed the comet uh, after it was seen at the eclipse. And what's striking is that many of these observations come from people on board ship. Uh, this is only three years after the Second World War finished. Um, there's still a lot of, of people um, uh, in, in the services around the world. And one of the things about people on ships is that they are generally extremely good observers. So they can measure very accurately directions and uh, elevations of things in the sky. So there were a lot of reports from observers on ships and in aircraft and around, around the world. And we even have a couple of really nice photographs of this comet. Um, these again were taken from South Africa. These are from the Radcliffe Observatory in Pretoria. These are in the BAA Comet Section Archive. And these are just simple photographs with wide field camera set up on a tripod, not, not tracked at all showing that it was a really nice comet in the uh, in the sky. And so this comet was is probably the, the best comet that we know that was seen at an eclipse, but then became a, a really nice comet afterwards, after it had moved far enough away from the sun and the sky to be seen as a comet in the, the night sky. So moving a bit closer to the um, Current day, the next one, the next comet seen in this eclipse was this one in 1963, uh, the eclipse of 1963, July the 20th. Now, this was a case where some French observers had specifically gone to an eclipse with the objective of trying to photograph faint comets near the sun. Um, and in this paper, they claimed to have actually detected a comet um, near to the sun on their photographs. But again, like many, many things, so frustrating. There is no, in this article, there is no picture published and there's no record of the negatives or any material whatsoever. So the only evidence we have, and I guess we can take it as reasonably good evidence, um, is this scientific paper that was published here that says that they saw this comet. Um, but it is very frustrating that we don't have anything other than that. We don't have the original material or any pictures. But this was different to the previous comets that had been seen during an eclipse. 
The previous ones have been bright enough to be seen with the naked eye during an eclipse. These are, this is a comet that was very faint and was just visible uh, when they developed the photographs, just visible on their photographs, not visible at the time. So a different kind of, of comet really to the 1882 and the 1948 ones. So if we come a little bit more up to date uh, about comets seen at eclipses, of course, there's this one, and many of you will remember this comet from the late 1990s, Comet Hale-Bopp, discovered in 1995, at its very brightest in the springtime of 1997. Um, it was a comet that was very unusual. It, it had a massive nucleus, probably something like 50 kilometers across. Um, it, was in an orbit that meant that we actually saw it for months and months on end. So it, it was in an orbit that didn't ever come particularly close to the Earth. But what it meant was that from where we are in the Northern Hemisphere, this comet was always visible to us as it went around through its perihelion. So it was a comet that was around for a very long time. And given that eclipses happen every 18 months or so, it's not that surprising that one happened while Hale-Bopp was around. And in fact, the eclipse of 97, 1997, March 9th, happened when Helbot was at about its brightest. And it was seen during that eclipse. Now, it wasn't seen close to the sun, and Helbot is definitely not a Kreutz sungrazer comet, but it was seen in the sky. Um, and it, it was actually photographed as well. There is a, a photograph that you can find online by some Japanese observers that show the eclipse and this comet at the same time. But Sheridan Williams, who, who many of you will know, um, was at this eclipse and he said that he actually saw it visually as well. So his quote down here, we saw everything from first to fourth contact. It was one of the best eclipses I have seen, probably because of the stunning landscape. We saw glorious orange prominences, Mercury, Venus, Jupiter and Comet Hellbop, and the temperature was minus 24 Celsius. So obviously a really nice eclipse with a comet in the sky. But again, a different kind of thing. It wasn't a comet that went very close to the sun. It just happened to be a very bright comet that had been around for a long time that happened to be visible in the daylight sky when the sun was blanked out. But it definitely is an eclipse comet. So that's 97 March the 9th. And then the most recent one prior to the, most, the latest eclipse is this one, uh, a comet in 2008, 2008 -01. It was discovered by SOHO, which is a spacecraft um, that is continually looking at the sun with a coronagraph. So it's looking around the sun to see if anything uh, appears in the sun's atmosphere. But it also is very good at discovering these Kreutz objects. And um, this IAU circular um, is the discovery circular for 2008-01, uh, which actually mentions that this bright Kreutz fragment may be observable during the total eclipse on August the 1st. So this was issued, um, I think, the day before the eclipse. So people knew that there was a Kreutz sun grazer um, and people did try and, and photograph it and they were successful. So here I introduce a, a person who you may know, um, who's probably the master of processing eclipse images. He's a, he's a guy called Miloslav Druckmuller. He takes images from a number of observers taken with different exposures, different focal lengths, and he does absolute magic on these images to combine them together into high dynamic range, high resolution photographs of the sun's corona. And you can see an example of that here. So here we've got the corona. The corona is, is really difficult to photograph because its brightness drops very, very rapidly as you move out from the, the sun's limb. So what you need to do is you take lots of exposures of different lengths and you combine them together um, to get these high dynamic range images. And then you process them carefully to bring out all the detail. And nobody does this better than Druckmuller does. And in the 2008 case, uh, he did that with two uh, colleagues, Aniel and Rushin, who took the images. And when they were all combined together, we got this lovely image of the corona, but also this tiny little puny 8.3 magnitude Kreutz Sungrazer comet C 2008-01 SOHO. 
So this showed that with technology advancing, um, that it was possible even to get really faint comets now during totality with the right skills and the right processing. So the implication is that we'd start to see more comets at totality um, because we haven't seen many in the past. So, so the historical ones uh, were the 413 one, the 1882, 1948, possibly the 1961. Um, and then this one, the 2008 is all the total number of comets that have been seen in history at total eclipses. So that brings us nicely on to the eclipse of last year, the eclipse of 2020, December the 14th. And I'm now going to talk about that eclipse, um, how I got there, what I did and what we did in order to, to get what I think at the moment is a unique result, which is that at this eclipse, not only did we see one comet during totality, but we actually saw two. One of them was expected, one of them was unexpected. So just start a little bit about this eclipse. <clears throat> Took place on December the 14th last year. Uh, totality started out in the Pacific Ocean, crossed the west coast of Chile, rushed across to the east coast of Argentina, and then ended um, at sunset just off the west coast of Namibia. And very conveniently, maximum eclipse and, and the center of the eclipse coincided with the point where it was crossing land. The vast majority of the track, uh, which is only about 100 kilometers wide, was over the ocean. And it was, it was really crossing land here, which is uh, luckily um, where the maximum was. And the maximum duration, about two minutes, 10 seconds, where this little yellow dot is. So if just zoom in on that a little bit. Uh, this is the track as it crosses South America. Um, it actually hits the west coast of Chile at 1601 and it leaves the east coast of Argentina at uh, 1622. So that's the center of the shadow. So it crosses the whole of South America in something like 21 minutes. Maximum eclipse was here and best weather was around about here. So here are the Andes. I know some of you may have been in, in Chile or Argentina for the eclipse the year earlier in 2019, which took place in the southern winter. This actually took place in the southern summer. Um, and so unlike the eclipse of 2019, which we saw very low over the Andes, this eclipse was very high up in the sky, about 70 degrees above the horizon at mid to mid totality. Um, the weather conditions were a bit different as well in that we had, uh, there's lots of cloud generally on the Chilean side of the Andes. Um, and then the prevailing winds usually coming in from the Pacific, you got a fairly clear area to the west, sorry, to the east of the Andes here in um, Argentina. And then the cloud built up again as you went towards the coast. So the ideal place to be was, was somewhere around here. And um, the company that I um, lead some tours as a scientific expert for, which is called um, Astro Trails, had done a lot of planning and had picked a number of sites. And one of the sites they picked was this site called Fortin Noguera, which is um, one of the was one of the best sites from a weather point of view. So as, as 2020 started, uh, the planning was for Astro Trails alone to be taking a huge number of people to see this eclipse. Uh, traveling to see eclipses is now on a lot of people's bucket lists. And so a lot of people want to do it. And the plan was probably for somewhere upwards of 800 people to be traveling um, with that one company alone, um, with potentially two or three different observation sites. Um, and then COVID happened and that all started to get um, a bit dicey, not only because of the fact that we had problems leaving the UK, but also the fact that in South America, they were having problems uh, with high, fairly high infection rates. So many of the companies that were planning trips to see the eclipse dropped out. Uh, people dropped out because they were worried about the pot potential arrangements. So very few of us actually got there to, to see this eclipse. And 
those of us who did, I think we were just um, incredibly privileged to do it. A lot of it came down to very hard work from the Astro Trails admin people who basically set all of this up and their local agents who negotiated with the Argentine government to allow us to enter Argentina without uh, quarantine as long as we had appropriate test results um, and traveled together in a, in a bubble and followed various protocols. Um, there were, up, I think, 180 or 190 of these permits available that had been specially negotiated for foreigners to come into Argentina. In the end, I think 90 odd of them were actually used. And of that 90, I think we, were, we had about half of them. So the group that I was with, um, there are about 45 people, I think, in that group. And in total, the number of foreigners in Argentina to see the eclipse was only twice that number. So very few people got to see this eclipse. Um, so I'm very, very privileged to have managed to get there to see it. And I'm particularly pleased because not only um, did we have a really nice lineup of planets during totality, so you had Venus, Mercury, and then that nice conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn, which was just um, getting quite close at the time. But we also had potentially a comet. And this what made, is what made it really interesting for me. There's a comet called C2020S3 Erasmus, which is not a Kreutz comet, it is a normal comet, but it happened to be coming to perihelion just two days before the total eclipse. It maybe was going to be fifth magnitude, something like that. So I thought it was extremely unlikely that it would be visible um, visually, but I did think it would be a good prospect to pick up photographically. And so I arranged um, to take a camera which basically was looking at a field of view uh, to the left of the sun here, just a fixed on a fixed tripod, taking loads of photographs one after the other. And my plan was to, to stack those photographs afterwards to see if I could find this comet. Um, the other optical equipment I took for the eclipse um, needed to be pretty compact because we didn't quite know how everything was going to work out. Um, we knew that there were going to be checks at all sorts of points. We knew that crossing um, internal state borders in Argentina was going to be possibly difficult. Um, so I didn't want to travel with my normal heavy load of a telescope and an equatorial mount. So I put together this uh, very compact eclipse camera, which consists of a, a Tamron 500 millimeter F8 mirror lens. Um, so those of you who are old timers in photography may remember those. Mirror lenses had a pretty bad reputation optically, but the Tamron ones are actually remarkably good. And rather than coupling it with a, an SLR camera, I coupled it with a <clears throat> one of the new planetary cameras from ZWO. This is the ASI 183, I think it is, which is a uh, got very small pixels, two, two point something micron pixels, um, but it's a one of these four thirds scale chips. So the kind of chips that you have in in mirror, small compact mirrorless cameras. So this camera gave me a really nice field of view of about one and a half by one degree. I uh, put it on a star adventurer mount so it would track the sun during totality. So here it is in the hotel room the night before the eclipse just being checked out. Um, so very lightweight, lightweight tripod, lightweight equatorial mount, lightweight uh, camera. And here's an example during the partial phase on the laptop of the field of view you get. So you can see it's about one and a half by one, one degree field of view. Um, now this camera uh, through a USB three connection to a laptop uh, would do something like seven frames a second in 16 bit um, color. And each frame is 5K by 3K pixels. So really high resolution frames at quite a nice high frame rate. So my, my intention was that I would take the best ones and stack them in a planetary way to get high resolution images. And that actually worked out pretty well, except for one thing, uh, which was a bit of a problem. So this is the weather prediction um, that we tend to look at before the eclipse, just to see how things are gonna go. This is for the site that we were headed to. We didn't really have any option to change site. 
because of the um, because of the conditions there. Um, and what this showed was the eclipse was at 1 p.m. local time on the 14th, that we would have lots of cloud in the morning. That cloud would clear and be clearing in time for the eclipse. And we were fairly confident that given the eclipse was high up in the sky, that we would actually get to see the eclipse. So that was that was kind of OK. But the bottom graph was really worrying. Um, and that is the wind speed. So in the summer in Patagonia, it's quite regular that you get quite strong gusty winds at that location because they're blowing down from the uh, from the um, Andes. A bit like the Mistral wind blows down in, in France. The, these are the South American equivalent. So they're normally fairly strong and gusty, but we were really unlucky. You can see this is the wind speed um, and this is the peak wind speed, these circles. And the eclipse was going to occur about here, um, right at the peak of a massive gusty wind, probably 70 kilometers an hour, average gusting to 90 kilometers an hour. So that's a nightmare for high resolution imaging, because that's just going to shake, shake the camera and telescope all over the place. When we arrived at the site, um, they'd allocated us because we'd said we wanted a field with good clear horizons so that we could see the shadow coming and going. They'd allocated us a field um, which had the most exposed horizons you could possibly imagine, which was great from the point of view of being able to see the horizons, but did nothing to attenuate the wind. And the wind was in fact so gusty that by the time we'd arrived, one of the portaloos that they'd put out for us had already blown into a small stream. Um, and they had to recover that. Luckily, nobody was in it, um, but it was clearly that wasn't going to work. And so we quickly um, managed to identify a, a horse paddock, which was surrounded by trees, which were going to would offer us a really nice windbreak. So we asked if we could use this and they, they said yes. They had to um, evict the horses who weren't particularly happy about ev being evicted from their field by a load of weird eclipse chasers. And uh, you might notice on this picture, the horses left behind lots of um, horse calling cards. So you had to be really careful walking around this field. It was thickly strewn with horse dung. Um, but anyway, that's by the by. The, the trees did a really successful jobs. So they reduced what was potentially a, a howling gale that would have wrecked everything into a strong breeze. Um, so this is my setup here. Uh, this is the camera you've already seen, the high resolution camera. Uh, I had a couple of other cameras. I had a video camera just pointing at the sun. I had a GoPro Hero 6 camera taking a wide field view of the sun. And then this is the camera I was using to try and get that comet. It's a Sony A7S um, SLR camera, actually a mirrorless camera uh, with a full frame sensor and a 100 millimeter Canon uh, f2 lens on the front so that gives a field of view of something like 22 by 15 degrees and the idea was to put the sun at the right edge of the field and hopefully when I then got around to stacking all the pictures afterwards I would pick up the comet and it would be the next comet on the list of eclipse comets following the 2008 one. So just to give you a few examples this is the high resolution uh, imaging system so this is the Tamron lens and the ASI camera. And you can see it does a pretty good job. This is during the partial phase. There was one tiny puny little sunspot. You can see a few faculae here and clearly you can see the moon uh, moving across the sun. So, so that camera system worked well, but these were shorter exposures. Um, as we got close to totality, um, I would have to use longer exposures for, for that camera. And so the wind became more of an issue. Um, this is a frame from the 4K video uh, that was shot by the GoPro camera, which are really nice cameras to give you a kind of idea of the wide field views during an eclipse. So you can see the, the light around the horizon. You can see the eclipsed sun here a bit overexposed. That's Mercury there and that's Venus. And you can also see that we actually had some cloud. And that cloud blew across very, very rapidly during totality. Um, and thin cloud covered the sun um, for about the first, first 30 seconds or so of totality. But that led to a very interesting effect. Uh, I'm not sure how well this will come out on, on Zoom, but um, this is the sun at second contact, diamond ring at second contact. And you may be able to see there are these, these lines 
aligned with the, the bright contact point. These are shadow bands. So shadow bands are an effect that's seen at the just as the start of totality and just at the end of totality. They're, they're an effect caused by effectively um, scintillation or twinkling of light in the Earth's atmosphere. So we, we see twinkling on stars where we see them twinkle in the, the sky. By the time you get very close to totality, the um, remaining light that's shining through a valley of the moon here is an extremely bright star. And so it twinkles in the same way that any other star would do. But because it's so bright, we can actually see the, the effect of that twinkling as bright and dark lines on the ground as shadow bands. But in this case, they're actually projected onto a screen in front of us, between us and the sun, which is the high level cloud. So th this is quite an unusual thing to see. It was very nice to see at this eclipse. It's been seen several times before, but, but the cloud here actually made for a very interesting phenomenon um, right at the start of the eclipse. Here it is again, this is uh, the second contact. This is from my fixed video now. You can begin to see a few prominences here. And again, very faintly, you can see shadow band effects. And you can also see this really nice colored corona um, on the clouds caused by the very bright um, star-like points here at the second contact point. Uh, just a few examples from the Tamron lens system. This is a picture, just a single frame showing um, the prominences. We had some very nice prominences uh, around the limb of the sun, including a, a very large run of prominences near the point where third contact would occur. So that's where the diamond ring at the end of totality occurs. You can see in this quite nicely that where uh, you get magnetic field loops above the prominences that appear in the solar corona. Um, but that's, oops, that's probably better shown in this shot. So this is actually, my at the moment rather pathetic attempt to to do a high dynamic range um, image of the sun but I, I found it really difficult to merge everything in so essentially everything within this dark circle is one exposure and then everything outside of the dark circle is another exposure so the dark circle itself isn't real um, but again you can see the prominences here you can see the loops above them you can see these things coming out from near the poles which are called polar brushes and you can see structure in the corona, which is caused by the sun's magnetic field uh, affecting the solar corona. So I was quite pleased with this. This is, this is an example of what that ZWO camera can do, um, coupled with, with a, just a, a Tamron mirror lens. And it's a very lightweight system that produced some really nice results, uh, but which you can carry in a, in a rucksack. So I think in future I'll be using this rather than taking a telescope to uh, eclipses. Um, so now on to a little bit more about comets. This is one of the frames uh, from that Sony system. So this is a 100 millimeter F2. Um, this is 1 40th of a second at ISO 400, single frame. Uh, what you can see is the eclipse sun. You can see the corona. You can see it's actually saturated, overexposed in the central part of the corona. And then you can see the outer corona here. You can see some structure in it. This is Mercury here, about three and a bit degrees away from the sun. And the comet is around about here. Now, you, ca you can't see this on a single exposure. But once you've calibrated the exposures, so once you've corrected them for vignetting that you get, so fainter towards the corners, and you stack them together, you can actually, oops, I've forgotten I put this one in. Okay, before we go on to the, the comets, at the, at the very end, um, when the eclipse was over, the horses decided that they'd been out of the field for too long um, and they came back in and, and they were particularly attracted by the fact that we'd been given bales of hay to sit on during totality and the horses obviously saw that as something nice to eat. So they, they came back in whilst people were packing up all of their eclipse kit um, they were very friendly horses. They didn't cause any problems, but um, but they they just basically ate, ate the seating out from underneath us. But yeah, back to the, back to the comets. So I've been hoping to uh, get an image of this comet called um, Erasmus um, 2020s3, um, but on the day of the eclipse, the SOHO satellite had taken some images and. Um, 
a person in um, Thailand called Warashit Boomplod, who looks at these images, had identified a Kreutz group comet in the images, which, which eventually was called 2020X3. And it turns out that um, we actually managed to image that from our site in Argentina. So this picture on the right here is a picture from the coronagraph <coughs> on Soho. This picture on the left here is a picture taken by one of the people in our group, a guy called Andreas Moller, Merler. And he was in our group, he was using a telescope with a Nikon F6 camera specifically to get high dynamic range images of the solar corona. So he was taking a sequence of exposures from long to short, which he stacked up and he was able to see that he had also caught the comet. So the first that we knew that we actually had a second comet from this site was the picture that Andreas had taken, which showed it here. Now Andreas was using a fairly long focal length and so he was really interested in taking pictures of the corona. So his images didn't show the other comet, the one that I was going for, 2020 S3, but they did show this one, 2020 X3, which was a Kreutz comet. So I then thought, well, I wonder if my images have got the Kreutz comet as well as the one that I was looking for. So this, this is a highly processed version of that image I showed a few minutes ago. Uh, what's happened here is that I've corrected for the background. Um, so effectively, I've, I've removed any vignetting. I've done flat fielding. I've stacked something like 70 exposures together, aligned on the star motion. And then what I've done is I've run a filter on here, which essentially removes the background completely. So all that's showing here is variations above the sky background. And what you've got, you've got the sun here with its uh, with its coronal corona, some features stretching out almost as far as Mercury. This is the comet that I was going for, 2020 S3 Erasmus. And amazingly, uh, there's a second comet here, very close to the sun, 2020 X3 Soho, the sun grazer. And this is, to my knowledge, the only picture of two comets seen a, at an eclipse in the entirety of human history. Um, so I'm quite proud of it, but somebody's going to come back and tell me that it's not the only one. But as far as I know, it is the only picture that we've got that shows two comets during totality. And the comets look very different. Um, here's a real zoom up on the comets. Uh, this one, 2020 S3, is a normal comet uh, at a fairly distant perihelion from the sun. It's a kind of greenish color, and that green comes from emission from um, carbon molecules of various types. It's the color that people will be familiar with who, who take photographs of comets there. They're mostly kind of greenish color. X3 on the other hand, the Kreutz comet was completely different. It was a yellowish color. And we believe that that yellow comes from uh, very strong sodium emission. This comet at the time that the pictures were being taken was in the process of being um, vaporized by the sun. Um, so whilst 2020 S3 is a long lived comet that we can still see now, 2020 X3 fell towards the sun and was completely ripped apart and vaporized only a few hours after we took pictures of it. So there are those two comets. They look very different, but they're both from the same set of photographs, both on the same frame, which I think is something, uh, as I say, unique. So I'd like to finish just by showing this. This is the result of what Milislav Druckmuller did to the pictures that um, Andreas Moller took. So this is Andreas's images taken with his telescope and Milislav's processing. So what we're doing here is we're zooming in on the, the totally eclipsed sun. You can see there the details on the lunar surface. And we can see those because if you were standing on the moon at the time of the eclipse, you'd have a very, very bright full moon in the sky, full earth in the sky. So this is Earthshine lighting up the, the Maria. You can see amazing details in the corona there um, and the amazing prominences too. And because Andreas took a whole range of different exposures 
uh, you can see over a very wide range of brightness levels. To the left of the sun where we're going at the moment, you can see a coronal mass ejection, which is that big bubble of material that's being blown out from the, the sun's atmosphere. So that's quite unusual to see a CME during totality. But we also had, of course, the, the wonderful um, images of the comet. And we're just going to zoom down to see that now. Um, and so what we'll see coming into the field of view is C2020X3, the Kreutz sun grazer. Um, and there it is, uh, even with a tail in Andreas's images, his, his images are much deeper and um, higher resolution than mine. So that's, that's uh, Miloslav Druchmuller's work on Andreas Moller's images, really spectacular and a really nice view of a comet at totality. Now, these are my images and what's happened here is Miloslav has taken my images and in the very inner part where mine are saturated, he's actually used Andreas's images as well. So this is a joint effort of my, mine, Andreas and, and um, Miloslav doing the processing. Down here, you can see Comet 2020 X3, the Kreutz sun grazer. There's Mercury just uh, whizzing past. And we move out to the west of the sun and zoom in on the other comet, much more healthy looking green comet. This is the comet that I originally intended these photographs to get when I had no idea that there would be a second comet on them. This is Erasmus C2020 S3. Um, so just amazing work. What, what Miloslav has done in processing these images is just absolutely astonishing. Um, he is an absolute um, sort of perfectionist. Where I took flat fields at the time and dark frames at the time for this, but I only took something like 40 flat field frames, uh, which he said was absolutely nowhere near enough. And in the end, he got me to take 400 flat field frames and 400 dark frames so he could average them out to beat the noise down. Um, and he's got some really clever software um, for doing the alignment and the, the HDR processing. Um, so really nice image. I put finally, before questions, I put some links up here, which will take you to uh, the images that I've included today. Um, I can um, let Steve or, or whoever have these, these links by email if anyone wants to have a look at them later or you can copy them down there. So um, that's my hour, just over, I think. Um, thank you very much for listening. Um, I hope I, uh, I managed to get through it without mentioning cricket or rugby, which Dusko will be pleased about. Um, so happy to take any questions now. Thank you, Nick. That was absolutely wonderful. Um, I particularly like those images. They're just spectacular, absolutely spectacular. And yeah. congratulations on getting the two comets in one image. Um, it may have been done before, but um, I've certainly never heard of it. Mm. So open to the floor for any questions for Nick. Mm. Everyone's fallen asleep. <clears throat> They're all Nick, still here. Nick, a couple <laughs> of things. What that um, old image you showed of the, of the comet close to the sun? Yeah. Is it a, um, a the angle you're looking at it because the tail wasn't pointing away from the sun? So I guess that's a perspective. Yeah. Thing. So you often with with the dust tails. Um, the, the tail stays in the comet's orbit plane. Um, so you often see comets that go very close to the sun. They have curved tails. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's a combination of, of the perspective you're looking at it and also the fact that dust tails, unlike gas tails, are not radially outward. They're in the plane of the orbit. And the other thing with the Kreutz, with the Kreutz comet, you said it was yellow because of sodium. Yeah. But um, Neowise last year had a sodium tail and that was red. Yeah, so I, I, I think a lot of that depends on the sensitivity of particular detectors and the color balance that you have when you're doing your processing. And you, you know that um, when you're processing astronomical images, um, it's quite difficult to get color balance. You know, what does the color balance mean? Because you're enhancing things and whatever. So, yeah, I mean, yes, Neowise definitely had a sodium tail that was reddish. Um, but it was primarily from sodium emissions, so it would have been kind of yellow, yellow, red. Yeah. But yeah, so, certainly that's what we think the reason for the, the yellow comet 
was that it's it's sodium. Nick, is there any um, kind of filter that you can use that's going to bring out the details of the corona on these um, images, eclipse images? So in the olden days, what people used to use was radial gradient filters. So mm. the, the brightness of the corona falls off very quickly. I think it falls off as something like one over the fourth power of the distance from the sun's limb. So that's a really rapid fall off. And in the old days, what people would have is they'd make a filter that had a, a radial gradient. So essentially it would have a lot more attenuation in the central part and then that would gradually tail off. And you'd have to align that with your camera so that when you took the pictures, the inner part was being filtered more than the outer part. Um, now that, that kind of worked, but it's a lot of really hard work to get stuff aligned. So people tend not to do that anymore. They now tend to go for this multiple exposure technique where essentially you're, you're taking multiple frames at different exposures. In mm. terms of kind of passband filters, um, certainly, uh, I mean, I, I, I've done some H-alpha imaging at total eclipses and that produces some really interesting um, results in the corona. So the corona is, is, is not H alpha so much, the prominences are, but the corona has got strong hydrogen alpha emissions in it as well. So that, that, can, that can help enhance some of the features within the, the corona. But the main thing is just to make sure that you get a wide range of exposures so that you don't, you don't saturate, but that you've got enough signal to noise ratio on the outer corona that when you process it, you can actually put them all together. Yeah. Yeah, explains why some of mine from Wyoming um, weren't so good. <laughs> well, it is extremely difficult to do, and you, it's something you need to go out specifically to do, which is to to set up a camera system that's going to take okay. exposures from hundredths of a second to several seconds. Uh, and ideally, you want to do that automatically rather than be chugging through it whilst this beautiful thing's going on above your head. True, true, very true. Any other questions for Nick? Silence. It's like Hi. being in, yes, it's like being in class at Morton College. <laughs> <laughs> With my science students. Mm -hmm. Nick, that was absolutely wonderful. I particularly enjoyed looking at the old comet pictures again to yeah. see what I missed in my lifetime. <laughs> um, Hale Bot was obviously the best one I ever saw, which I was lucky enough to see from the Orkney Islands when it was really high, it was absolutely spectacular. Um, and so we have to thank you again for giving a talk to our section and hopefully you'll be doing it again and again in the future. Okay. Uh, so a, a round of applause for Nick, please, from everybody. Okay. <laughs> And well, you, done. Everybody. and well done, Nick, of capturing the two during the uh, eclipse. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah, well, there is a there is a lot of luck involved there, I have to say, but still it was nice to do. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's gotta be funny what you get in it. these images. Yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, next thank you. Next month we have uh, Melissa Galoni talking to us about galaxy evolution. <laughs> Um, that's on the 12th of April. Look forward to seeing you all then, same time, 12th of April. And hope you all have a good evening. Thank you, Nick, again. Yeah. Okay. Cheers, everybody. Bye. Cheers, guys. Bye. 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 Bye